Larry has loved me unconditionally. I've put him through every test there is. There isn't a test I haven't put him through. You ought to try telling someone that you love who thinks you're the most perfect. He, he's always felt I was just perfect. I had to try to tell him that I'm not who you think I am at all. I'm a really bad person. My father started coming into my room when I was five, and it didn't stop until I was 18. The trauma was so severe that I did what many children do. In order to survive, I split. It's called dissociate. I split into a day child and a night child. I had no knowledge of the night child. The problem is, when you bury feelings alive, they just sit there until something triggers them. And then they come up like it's happening in real time. What I needed most of all was to find just one woman who had survived the reliving of the memories and the feelings. If I could find just one woman, I'd know it was possible. I never found her. Miss America, Marilyn Vandiver, Miss America of 1958. Thank you very much. She was a woman capable of capturing the 1958 Miss America crown, an icon of 50s America imagining itself at its best. But well, ladies and gentlemen, here is a perfectly wonderful American family. Or so the world thought. Because sexual abuse of children is something that happens, as with Marilyn, in the middle of the night, and because children are told that they should never tell or serious things will happen to them, they keep it silent. The secret is too huge and too intense. You don't have relationships with anybody. The only, all I had was my father. What I wanted to my father's death was his daytime love. And I never got that. I just got him at night. And that's all I had. And that's all I had to cling to until I met Larry Adler when I was 15. <laughs> First of all, she was a knockout, she was a beautiful lady, but far more important, she was fun. Uh, she had a magnetic personality. My mom was a sophomore and my dad was a senior and they were both on student council getting ready for the Christmas party. When he said, would you like to go to the drugstore and buy some wire? Yes, I would, yes, I would. She was smitten from day one. I think he had to come around a little, but boy, once she hooked him, he was done for. And so our love story began. Do I believe in love at first sight at age 15? I do, because it happened to me. There he was. I was just transfixed by him. From the day we met, I wanted to create an environment that fostered the most enjoyment and security she could ever have. And I still am dedicated to that. He went to college um, the following year, and we wrote every single day, every day we wrote. Could not wait until he came home for summer. And when he came home for the summer, he came to the door and I said, I'm leaving, I'm going to Europe for this summer. He said, why are you going? Why are you leaving? I said, I'm going to Europe. So the next year we wrote every single day and he came home for the summer, came to my door and I said, I'm going to summer school in Wisconsin at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Why are you going? I thought she was nuts. One day she was in love with me and the next day she was gone. That was very difficult. I was a sophomore at the University of Colorado when I was a Pi Phi. The only reason you could leave a meeting is if you had a long distance phone call. And Larry was calling me from, he was at Washington and Lee. So I, could, I got to leave the meeting. So I'm on, talking to Larry on the phone and I hang up and when I hang up and go out, the meeting's over. 
and 60 girls are going out for coffee dates. And two of the last girls out said, you're our nomination for Miss University of Colorado. And I said, no, I'm not. I don't want to do that. And they said, well, we have to have the nomination in the morning, the meeting's over, and you're our nomination. So I won Miss University of Colorado in late April. I was Miss Colorado in July. Miss Colorado, Marilyn Van Derber at the Hammond organ. And I was Miss America in September. It was in the middle of the on and off again. And uh, we were kind of on the on. And uh, I was watching the Miss America pageant, which at that time was the biggest show on television. Miss Colorado wins. 20-year-old Marilyn Elaine Vanderbilt. Marilyn Vanderbilt was just crowned Miss America. I didn't drink alcohol, uh, but I left my house and uh, drank a little alcohol that night because I knew that was the end of our relationship. I didn't want to do it. I'm a tomboy. I don't want to ever put on a swimsuit again unless I'm swimming. There was nothing about it that I wanted to do, and I won. Inside, I'm, I'm saying, if you really knew who I was, you would not even let me be in the room with you. So I had this inner struggle that I didn't even know about. I had a panic attack before every single thing I did as Miss America. Would I do it again? I would. It was an invaluable experience. There were so many times when I would say to myself, I can't do that, and then I would do it. Today, Timex is in. Look at my Timex. I had a very exciting television life. I did uh, Candid Camera and To Tell the Truth, and I was the hostess of the Cotton Bowl Parade and the Thanksgiving Parade, and I was the AT&T television spokeswoman. Well, since no telephone follows you around, Extension phones are the answer to complete telephone convenience. The biggest night of my professional life, I was asked to be the hostess of the Bell Telephone Hour. They had four shows a year. They brought in the finest music from around the world. And speaking for the Telephone Hour, here is Marilyn Vandenberg. Tonight, we celebrate 21 years of the Telephone Hour. It was flawless. It was flawless. And I went back to my apartment, and I thought, is that all there is? Why do I feel empty? And needless to say, the proud father. Oh, she's been a lovely gal all her life. And this image was almost too perfect. At least that's what Dee Dee Harvey, her youth minister, suspected. When Marilyn was 24, he asked the question that unleashed her painful memories. I do remember saying something to her about, did your father come to your bedroom? I met my youth minister, Dee Dee Harvey, when I was 15, and I was very involved with Dee Dee. I would bring people, teenagers to him who needed to be helped and healed. I was always bringing people to him, and he was watching me. I was 24, I flew to Hollywood to do some television work, and I called Dee Dee, he was, had a church in Santa Monica, and I said, I just called to say hi, I don't have time to see you, and he said, where are you? I said, I'm at the Beverly Hills Hotel, and he said, stay there. And he came in and sat down. He said, okay, now I know. This was nine years. Now I know she's trying to destroy herself. Why is she leaving every summer when she's in love with Larry? When I married someone other than Larry and divorced three months later, I married into an abusive marriage. Of course I did, because that's what I felt I was worthy of. But I didn't understand that. I didn't know what was driving my life. And I don't, I don't remember what he asked me. Did your father come into your room at night? I don't remember. I just, the memories just, just came surging up. And I, I, I just, I sobbed to exhaustion. When she could finally get composure enough, she gasped out, don't tell anybody. And the instinctive thing I said was, who don't you want me to tell? And I said, Larry. He said, then he's the only one we have to tell. I had guests over for dinner and the telephone rang. I went and answered it and it was Lynn. I called Marilyn Lynn and it was Lynn. And she said, if you've ever loved me, 
please come out and see me in California. And I said, no, thank you. I'm done with you. You're out of my life, and I'm in love with someone else. And I hung up the phone, and I just sobbed. I, I sobbed because he wasn't coming, and I sobbed because I was so happy that he wasn't coming, because how could I possibly tell him? He would have to go back to when I was 15, 16, 17, 18. I was a perfect teenager, kissing me goodnight at the door, and then he would have to go back and see me going down the hall to my father. It just was just, I, how could I tell him that? Hung up the phone, Dee Dee said, give me the number, and I said, no. He said, give me the number. Dee Dee Harvey called me immediately thereafter and said, if you've ever loved her, if you've ever loved her, she needs you right now. It was so overwhelming, all of these memories coming up. I hung up the phone, I called my parents in, and I said, what would you do? And both of them knew that I'd been hurt quite a bit. My dad said, don't be a damn fool, which was how I was feeling. And my mother said, follow your heart, my son. So the next morning, he came. He came into Dee Dee's office. I was just sobbing. I couldn't even look up. I couldn't look at him. And I thought Dee Dee would tell him. Instead, Dee Dee said, Marilyn has something to tell you. I said, I can't. I can't, crying so hard. He said, well, wait until you can. Struggling to find words. Finally, when Larry understood what I was saying, he enfolded me in his arms and he just held me and he said, I understand everything now. All she said was my father came to my room and that's all I had to hear. I wanted to marry her right then and there. It was two years. I didn't marry until I was 26 and he was 28. And it was uh, the happiest day of my life. When I married Larry, one of his many gifts to me is that he wanted me to be whoever I wanted to be. And I wanted to be a motivational speaker. So she left a very lucrative and exciting career to become a motivator. I wanted to be the best motivational speaker. You can do anything in the world that you want to do. You can be anything that you want to be, but your success or your failure will not depend on genius, talent, age, appearance, health, or luck. It will depend strictly on you. She was on the speaking tour. She was in three cities a day and four days, five days a week traveling, speaking all over the country. And I just came along until I was too big. And then she kept doing it till I was five. I came home from a successful speaking tour. I was 39, and I felt a strange, compelling urge to lie down. And I went into paralysis. I couldn't move. She would barely whisper. She'd have no energy whatsoever. Oh, he called the doctor. The doctor came. By the time the doctor got there, I was up walking around, so embarrassed. But she would have these spells, and they'd last for two to six hours and they were all the time, and it was difficult to understand what was going on. One of the doctors was, was my uncle by marriage, and he was just devastated he couldn't figure it out. He came back in and he said, you know, my darling, I wonder if this has anything to do with your turning 40. Perhaps if Miss America could not age gracefully. <laughs> Oh, his question was brilliant. It was all about age, but not my age. Jennifer was turning five. And as she turned five, all the memories and the feelings began coming up. And my conscious was trying to repress all of these feelings that I had. During those days, those many days when I was in paralysis for longer periods of time, I knew that I had to confront my father. And I called my father. I said, I need to speak to you. He said, come on over. I drove as quickly as I could to make sure that the doors and the screens were unlocked and opened. Of all the feelings I had about my father, terror was one through 10. He came in and sat down on the far side of the breakfast room table, which had always been his seat. And after he was seated, I said, 
This is the most difficult thing I've ever done. And he said, I'll be back in a minute. And he went up the winding staircase two by two. I waited for a phone call to be made or a toilet to be flushed, but he came back immediately. And I knew he had a gun. I knew he could kill himself or me or most probably both of us without ever batting an eye. If that sounds incomprehensible to you, you have never lived in an incest family. Terror reigns, not fear, terror. After our conversation, I rose to leave and he pulled out the gun. He said, if you had come in any other way, I would have killed myself. Oh, the message was very clear. If you are even thinking about exposing me, take a good look at the consequences. We only spoke of it once. He said, if I had known what it would do to you, I never would have done it. For 16 years, I clung to a thin shred of hope that maybe, if he had known, he wouldn't have done it. But when I was 56, I received a letter from a woman in Denver who told me that my father had sexually violated her about 20 times when he was 75. He died of a heart attack at age 76. My father knew exactly what he was doing, and he continued to do it until he died. He was a miserable, evil person. Her mother was congenial and likable on the outside, and she was just as, in my opinion, as evil as the father. I had a reporter say to me, did your mother know? And I said, it went on in our home for 18 years. Would you know if something went on in your home for 18 years? Of course she knew. My mother walked down the hallway one night. I was about 11 or 12. My father always came in late at night and he'd been in my room for maybe a half hour. And all of a sudden I, I heard footsteps coming down. I could hear the first step and then the second step very, very, very slowly and then the third step. And she was now about 12 feet from my door and I waited to hear another step and it was just, it was a dramatic moment when everything stopped for all three of us. All three of us knew exactly what each one of us was thinking and knew. It's the only time I ever felt my father afraid. He just stopped and I thought, it's going to be over. She's going to come in. And we waited for that dramatic moment. And then I heard a step up the steps and up the steps and up the steps. And I knew she would never come through that door. And I knew she would never, ever come to help me. But I do believe she made a decision. I believe she made a choice. And she didn't choose me. I was still able to, to function. I could still give speeches, but the panic attacks and the anxiety became overwhelming. And as Jennifer started puberty, I was scheduled to speak before 600 insurance men from North America. And this time, as I went up on the stage, inside I was screaming, I can't do this. I can't do this. And I held onto the podium with both hands and I'm, my voice inside is saying, I can't do it. And another voice is saying, you've done it a thousand times. And I, I made it through the talk. I, got a, I, I did a good one, I got a standing ovation. I made my way to a phone. I couldn't call Larry because he would have rented the Concord. I called Dee Dee and I said, I'm not sure I can get home. Could you meet my flight? But don't say anything to me, don't talk to me. Could you meet my flight? I'm having a really hard time. When I got home, it's the only time in knowing Larry since I was 15, and I'm going to be 80, 
that he has ever told me what to do. And he said, you're done. And I said, I'm done. But she would go into crying spells that shook her whole body and they'd last for two to six hours. And they were all the time and it was difficult. I was thrown into what we call recovery. All the feelings that I had as a child, but much harder as a teenager, all of those, I tried to say so still, but all the feelings that I had of humiliation and degradation and anger and pleasure, that was the hardest one. All of those feelings, I just stuffed them somewhere. The problem is when you bury feelings alive, they just sit there until something triggers them. And then they come up like it's happening in real time. We couldn't lock our doors. I had no protection. So I just learned how to lock up my body into a very tight fetal position. And then he would pry me open. And I was feeling all of those feelings. I've never seen anyone go through what she did. And she was determined to complete recovery and come out the other end. And toward that end, she tried every kind of therapy, dance therapy, drawing therapy, self-defense therapy, talk therapy, hypnosis, uh, everything. So at age 50, I checked myself into the psychiatric ward at Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. No one on the staff disclosed. The women were as dysfunctional as I was. The process of recovery is beyond description. I mean, I can't tell you what it's like. Excruciating emotions came up. She was dysfunctional. Is that the way she's going to be the rest of her life? Is that our relationship? And and what do I do with Jennifer? Larry and I would have sessions just to try to get me through another day. And Jennifer would be sent to her room. And one day, she was 13, we were in the mountains. And I went to make a phone call at a cabin a mile away and she came with me and I ended up sobbing. And Jennifer said, what's wrong, mommy? I tried to find words. I, I, I just didn't know how to try to explain it to a 13-year-old daughter. I was sobbing and she started crying and no one had ever cried for me. It was just one of the most moving moments of my life. We didn't say anything. We got back in the car. We were driving back and Jennifer said, you know, mom, you've changed so many people's lives with your speeches. Think how many more lives you could change if people knew this about you. I was stunned. I said, well, what if your friends knew Jennifer? And she said, they would respect you more. I think my mom had so much shame about what had happened to her that she was afraid that I wouldn't love her if I knew that about her. She became one of my healers. She, she just never understood shame. She'd say, mom, you didn't do anything wrong. Everybody respects you so much in your current life. Imagine if they knew this about you. Imagine what they would think if they knew this. And it was difficult to understand what was going on, but it was, in retrospect, it was very fortunate that she had these spells. Many other people don't have them when they go through recovery, and it is so difficult that they commit suicide or become drug addicts or other terrible things. I had thought if I ever got through it, which was questionable in my mind, I would go back to my speaking. I'd been named the outstanding woman speaker in America. I wanted to go back to my life. After going through those six years, I could never have gone back to that life. I had to help. I, I had to help. And so with all the courage that I had, I said, I want to set up an adult survivor program because my recovery was just too difficult. It took two years, and the man that they had hired out of Seattle, the, the psychiatrist, 
he came over and sat down with Larry and me and he said, would you come just to talk to 10 psychiatrists and 10 survivors? Okay. So the day I'm to speak, May 8th, 1991, I get a phone call. We think a reporter is coming. You think a reporter is coming? My whole world is about ready to collapse. The next morning, it's on the front page of the Denver Post. I didn't know what to do. The phone rang and a woman said, you will need to have a press conference. I said, a, a press conference? Never. She said, they will call your mother and your three sisters. I said, what time is the press conference? Larry and Jennifer and I went. There were about 30 cameras there. The next morning, it was on the front page of the Rocky Mountain News and the Denver Post, and they were calling my sisters. I said to Larry and Jennifer, I have to get out of here. So we pulled on some sweats, and we went to the high school track. We jogged around the track. We'd done that so many times. The woman with her two dogs came. We always said hello. This time, she stopped me. She said, Marilyn, we're so proud of what you're doing, and I am so grateful your sister Gwen came forward this morning. And I said, really? Why? And she said, because yesterday, on our most popular radio talk show, people were calling in and saying, why should we believe her? Now that your sister has come forward, they will have to believe you. I was stunned. I looked at her and I said, if people are not going to believe 53-year-old me, then who is going to believe a child? It was a life-changing moment for me. I went home, I called the newspapers, I called the television stations, and I said, let's get to work. It was on the front page six times. It was on every morning, afternoon, evening news show for days. Survivors were coming out. I called Dee, Dee who was in retirement, and I said, gird up your loins. <laughs> you are no longer in retirement. We have a, a thousand people. We have to, people are knocking, people would fly in and knock on my door. The mail came in mail bags. People were coming out everywhere because the, because the papers were honoring me. About two weeks after my story became public, Didi called me and he said, we have to hold a meeting. People have to see you. And I said, okay. And Larry, Jennifer and I, I didn't want to be early. So about 6.59, we walked into the back of the church. I was expecting 200 people. There were 1,100 people wrapped in shame. Everybody had their heads down. Nobody wanted to be seen. Everybody wanted to be invisible. And I had said to Jennifer, they're going to need to meet you. They need to see that you can have a wonderful child. And I said to Larry, they are really gonna need to see you. They need to know that a wonderful marriage is possible. A marriage can survive this. So Jennifer stood up. She was a sophomore at Duke. She stood up and spoke. This is my hero, but more importantly, this is my mother, Marilyn Van Brat. And then I ended my talk. My name is Marilyn Van Der Brattler. I survived incest from age five to age 18, and I feel no shame. I have no shame. I have no shame. And that became my talk. For her to be able to say, I feel no shame is just just really hit me, it just struck me, because I was familiar by then with, with survivors of abuse, and they all felt shame. When my story went to the cover of People magazine, it didn't say Marilyn and rape. It said, Miss America, okay, now I know why I won. I never could figure out why I won. Now I know why I won, because this is the mission I was given, Miss America, overcomes, not rape, not incest, shame. 
It's about shame. And no one can know us unless they know this about us. This is the core of our being. If you are raped or sexually assaulted, this is in the core of your DNA. She asked if I would uh, be able to come to OBGYN Grand Rounds at the university, at the University of Colorado. And so I was able to bring my class there. Every speech that I give, at the end, I ask survivors to stand. We can be in a room of a thousand people at a black tie corporate dinner, <laughs> and I will ask survivors to stand. And it is heart-wrenching. After her speech, she asked survivors to stand. And I stood. She made me realize, and she makes other survivors realize, that we are carrying shame that does not belong to us. It belongs to the perpetrator. It, belong, it, it was my mother's shame. As someone said to me, why are, are incest survivors called survivors? And I <laughs> looked at her and I said, well, why do you think? She said, well, I have no idea. You're stronger. I said, no, no, no. We usually survive a suicide. I've been in touch with more adult survivors than anyone in America. It's my mission. It's my passion. She spends anywhere from five to seven hours a day talking to survivors. So Dee Dee and I founded an organization called Sun Survivor United Network. And we saw up to 500 people a week free. And then she ultimately wrote this book, um, Miss America by Day, in the course of which she spent months studying the brain. I mean, she was so technical. It's now being used as a textbook in colleges, as well as being used by therapists and survivors. There are no words to really explain um, the impact that she has had on my life, and I know thousands and thousands and thousands of other people's lives. The most terrible times in my life, Marilyn was there for me. For her to be able to be that person for so many people who had come through it, still married to my dad and in a happy relationship, and to, to have a happy life and a, you know, a functioning daughter and, you know, all those things, I think, um, took a tremendous amount of courage. I know she's been the most important person in my life, and that's a lot to say about someone. She had a choice. I mean, she could have just closed the doors and turned off the lights, and instead she chose to step into the light and be a beacon for the, you know, I don't know, probably millions across the world of people who have had similar experiences. The Miss America pageant called to ask if I would be a celebrity judge. I said I would be happy to be there if they would introduce me with the following words. Former Miss America, Marilyn Vanderbilt Atler, now committed to helping adults sexually violated as children. And it seemed only appropriate that the most important accomplishment of my life be mentioned. Named outstanding woman speaker in America, former Miss America, now committed to helping adults who have been sexually violated as children. Marilyn Vandiver Atler. What I needed most of all was to find just one woman who had survived the reliving of the memories and the feelings. If I could find just one woman, I'd know it was possible. She could not find one person who had made it through recovery still married to their spouse or not, you know, as an addict or all the things that people do to just try to get through it. I never found her, but I now am that woman. If you were fondled once or many times, if you were sexually abused, violated, raped by a family member, someone in the religious or educational communities, a friend, a neighbor, a stranger, reach out it's the secrets and the shame that keep us shackled. I'm an incest survivor, and since I was 53 years old, it took me some time. 
I feel no shame. No one has done more for survivors than Marilyn and Larry. They've created a roadmap for all of us to follow. The recovery is a really difficult process, but it's so worth it. If you haven't found one person to tell, find someone that you trust and tell them. It will help you move forward in your journey and it will help you feel better about yourself. Speaking out puts a crack in shame. I found a voice. I found a place that I can express myself. The first time I acknowledged in public that I'm a survivor was when Marilyn asked us to stand. And I didn't want to stand at first. But as I looked around and I saw everybody around me standing, I thought, yeah, I can do this. I'm not alone. I stood. I stood for my wife and family. I stood for myself, my brother, and other male survivors. I stood, and now I stand with you. I believe you, and you're not alone. You are never alone. We believe you, and you can heal, you can thrive, you can be your whole self again. Because of Marilyn, I now am that woman. I now am that person. I now am that woman. I now am that man. I now am that person. I now am that woman. I now am that friend and that brother. Some people are born with courage, others have to have it inspired in them. Marilyn, that's what you do and what you've done for so many. Thank you. Marilyn and Larry, thank you. Just thank you. My mom would be the first to say that she would be at best homeless and most likely dead if it weren't for my dad. Uh, today I will have four or five hours before I go to sleep with her. I look forward to that. Just two days ago, I called her out in California, and they are giggling so hard that my mom's like, I'm sorry, I just can't talk. I don't know, but I'm crazy nuts about her, and I have been all this time. Uh... They are as in love as they were when they, you know, when they were kids. It's just the most amazing love story, and they have been to the depths of hell together through her, through her recovery, and they just absolutely adore each other. Don't I have the best life? Don't I have the best life? Haven't I had the most interesting life? Truly, just, I've been on the highest mountain and I've been to the bottom of the well. I've, and because I've been to the bottom of the well and survivors know that, they come to me because they know I have. And if I hadn't been there, they wouldn't come to me. So it's, it's a life of privilege. I love it. Tonight is a night for wishing. If you could have one wish, what would it be? This is my wish for you. I wish you bluebirds in the spring to give your So with my best, my very best, I set you free. I wish you shelter from the storm, one cozy fire to keep you warm. But most of all, when snowflakes fall, I wish you